Welcome back to the Center on Buffalo podcast. We are here today with Josh Reed, the Emmy Award winning sportscaster who now resides in Buffalo, covers the team, get to see him each and every week. So it's an honor to sit down with him. It's always a pleasure. Uh, this will be probably similar to our our. Uh, conversations that we generally have the night before the game over a beer out for a bite to eat but uh let's hop into this one josh welcome to the center on buffalo podcast brother uh e thanks for having me man i appreciate it some of my favorite nights are when we're out on the road just sitting around having a beer and you know i think i think a lot of your listeners you know be surprised to find out that a lot of the times we're not even talking about football we're just talking about life and everything else that, that comes with it yeah, yeah, we probably should be grinding on the content for the game the next day, but we end up telling stories and linking with buddies in whatever town we're at and having a good time. But that's that's the perk of the job being the radio guy. You know, if I was working for CBS, which I was trying to get Jay Feely to meet us for wings when we were snowed in Buffalo, he said, bro, I have a two-hour production meeting from three to five, then we have another meeting later in the night. I don't think I'm going to be able to make it work. And, you know, you get an extra full day to prep, and those guys still can't even – peel out so being the radio guy although my salary is not the same definitely has its perks but real quick so you know we're here recording at 10 a.m is it like were you born with your hair like that and you're just destined for tv <laughs> yes you know i sleep with one of those bags over my head so that you can so it doesn't get messed up no um no you know when you don't sleep you know, I've got I've got three kids under the age of four, so I don't sleep a whole lot. So when you're sitting up and you never lay down, your hair doesn't get messed up. So, uh, yeah, but um, no, yeah, it, we've got we've got a bunch of little ones running around. But yeah, it, I do the best that I can. It's not bad for what forty six going on forty seven. It's it's holding in there. It's definitely holding in there. So uh, for those that don't know, you just had your fourth boy. You got three in the house. Uh, how's life yeah. with three young boys running around? Well, you know, with, with when we had the, the most recent came a month and a half ago. So when it was two under the age of three, you've heard of like organized chaos. Right. Well, this third one baby came and now it's just chaos. It's just it's just trying to survive. Yeah. You know, March Madness, the whole survive in advance. That's that's become my daily motto. It's just make today is make it to Thursday. You know, just trying to make it to Friday, get get one more day in the future. But it's fun, man. Uh, you know, I, I think you would agree with this. There's no better reward than, than being a dad. I mean, it, it's just what it's all about. I mean, it. You know, they they the you, they'll drive you up the wall. But at the same, the next minute they do something and you go, that's, that is what it's all about. I come home from work for a dinner break. And when the two-year-old sprints at me yelling daddy and gives me a hug, I mean, that's, that, you know, that's why we work. That's why we come home from work. It's, it's everything. Yeah, that's, that's well said. You and your wife are going to take an RV trip across the country. How, how yeah. are you, me and Leslie have been talking about that. Like, are you expecting a lot of ups and downs a lot of the way, or are you hopefully optimistic that it's just going to run completely smooth? Oh, it's not going to go smooth. Okay. I mean, it's just not. I mean, I, I fully expect, I, I embrace the chaos. I mean, that's kind of what you have to do at this point. Luckily, my wife is the most patient person in the absolute world. She is a gem. Um, so yeah, you know, it, I, we we bought an RV, you know, I think a lot of guys like their dream is, hey, one day I want to buy an RV and I'm going to drive it across the country. I want to see everything. And my wife is kind enough to let me realize those dreams and go, hey, you know what? If you want to do it, don't just talk about it, do it. And so we said, you know what, let's let's do this. Um, yeah, I had never even driven an RV. And it, this is one of those motorhomes. It's like an A class. So it kind of looks like a tour bus. I've never even driven one until literally the day we purchased it. The guy was like, so do you want to go out and drive it? Have you driven one before? I was like, nope. So, um, and I got, I got behind the wheel. It's not as hard and as intimidating as you might think it is. Uh, but yeah, so we're heading out across the country. going to hit every state. We're going, you know, we're going to go hit Disneyland, which I know that you guys just went to recently. Looking forward to that. The boys are looking forward to it. Uh, we got some friends out in California. We're going to Arizona, New Mexico. 
then hit Colorado on the way back, Utah, do that kind of stuff. Yeah, we almost did a West Coast trip uh, during COVID. Uh, kids were out of school, but then the ACC was still playing ball and you know, college football was still playing. So I had to go to all these college football games. So I had told her, I said, because I wasn't traveling for the Bills gig that year. So I said, if if college football gets canceled, we'll go out West. And she was she was getting on board because my wife, that's that's not her dream either. I just thought, how awesome would that be? We'll just go steal some time with the family, go out West. I got a question. Um, during the fall, you won't be able to take any extended trips with this RV. Uh, can this become my Madden vehicle? Yes, a hundred percent. In <laughs> fact, I've had a few people that are season ticket holders say, Hey, you know, if I want to use that on a weekend, what do you think about that? I say, as long as you're not jumping through a table, have at it. I, you know, it's, it, it's for everybody to kind of share and enjoy amongst friends and family. And yeah, so I, I have a feeling it's going to be parked outside the stadium quite a bit. And, uh, you know, I know a lot of times you jet right after the game to get back home to, to, to the wife and the kids and everything, but you stick around, we can have a beer. We can hang out at the, hang out at the RV post game. We can do center on Buffalo post games from there. I think that sounds like a great idea. Yeah. We just got to get you out of your, uh, post-game responsibilities yeah. or I'll, I'll be hanging out another tailgate for too long that it won't be any good content yeah yeah I'm pretty sure my boss is gonna want to pass on that so we'll figure out there's always a loophole though yeah yeah we can figure that out all right let's jump into some stuff I, I know you want to hear about my hole in one from last week yes yeah absolutely yeah we're, we're hey we are completely ignoring the elephant in the room first of all a hole in one I mean look you're, you're a man of faith and I admire that about you. I mean, outside of having the kids, religious experience-wise, where's the hole-in-one rank? Because, I mean, that's got to be – that had to be pretty sweet. It, it's up there, and mainly because of the circumstances. So I'm on day three of a guy's golf trip at my country club, Medalist Golf Club, which I never envisioned in my wildest dreams I would join, be able to join a place like that down in Florida. It's down in Hobie Sound. I think seven of the top 10 players in the world play and practice out of there. Very small membership. No one's ever out there. And it's my happy place. I go there. My heart rate drops. Well, that day, Leslie was flying down. And so she was flying down to meet me for three kidless nights for the start of a trip, just the two of us. Now my guy friends were going to be there still through that day. Another couple was going to stay with us. But so Leslie's flying down as this happens. And, and look, I, I used to, I love my wife to death and she's my greatest encourager, but she's also my greatest uh, reality check at times. I used to hunt up in Buffalo and she would always say, you go hunting, but you never kill anything. I'm like, well, <laughs> I'm not going killing. You actually have to like be patient with it. And then, you know, I play in all these golf tournaments, which are tough to win. And then finally we won one. And when I texted her, Hey, you know, you should probably come up here and bring the kids. We need to get a picture with the trophy. And this is at Valhalla golf. This is at Valhalla golf club where the rider or the PGA championships being played this year. They've had hosted the Ryder cup. So I won their last tournament before the PGA and she wouldn't believe me on that one. And then when I told her I got the hole in one, I think she just responded back like, no, dot, 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 dot. But it was, it was an awesome experience. My favorite caddy, uh, this guy, Sean, down at Medalist, who I absolutely love. We're playing a fivesome with four of my best friends. Hit it on my favorite hole out there. I mean, it was, and it was, it wasn't a skunked shot either. It was a seven iron that I absolutely smashed a little crosswind and it lands an inch from the hole and backs up into it. So it was, it was an awesome day. Did you uh, know I, it? Did you know it when you hit it? Did you go, that's got a chance. Well, yeah, I did. And so did everyone else in the group. They're like, oh, this looks good. And then we just all went nuts because we could see it go in. I was still like just cautious that maybe it jumped yeah. over the green and it was an optical illusion. But uh, going up and everyone's got film on it. So if you haven't seen it yet, it's all over my social media because one of my proudest moments. But but I'll say this. It was really cool. So, yeah, like everyone gets a drink on you in the clubhouse and that's fine. And this isn't a crowded golf club. So and it's not a. I mean, you can have a good time there, but, you know, people are generally going there to party unless it's maybe a tournament or you're on a guy's golf trip. You know, a lot of guys are there practicing, um, you know, to go out and play a competitive, serious round. But I thought it was cool. My buddies started buying me the drinks and we go out to eat that night and they had a, you know, a dessert made with a hole in one logo on uh -huh. it where we're like normally everyone's like, oh, 
you know, drinks on the, you know, the dude who got the hole in one. I thought it was cool that they made me feel like they, they brought it back and they hooked me up. So, uh, really awesome day, really awesome experience. And, um, it, it was everything I'd hoped for. I, I used to joke with Leslie. I'm like, I would literally pay $10,000 and walk out the door and get a hole in one today. Like just pay that money, just want that experience. And, uh, I didn't have to pay that, but it, it did live up to the hype. And then when I walked into the pro shop afterwards, they had this gaudy Michael Jordan golf bag. That's like one of three in the world. That's like a custom jump man golf bag. I was like, I'll take it. Just give it to me. I gotta, I gotta give myself some kind of present. So Really, really awesome trip. That's great, man. That's great. We should probably talk about bills now. At least All right, let's go. I feel like, by the way, I feel like at this point, listeners and viewers are, are like, okay, this is what it's like when they sit around and have beers on a Saturday before a Sunday game. And that this is literally what you just heard for the last 11 minutes was what, what it sounds like. And then we normally get to bills eventually. What do you, you know, going to this off season, you know, a lot of, a lot of question marks. You know, they're up. They're strapped against the cap, man. I mean, Bean's going to have to do some magic, and we've seen him do it in the past. No reason to think he can't do it again. But I mean, when you look at the position groups, are there any that you look at and go, "Man, they've they've got to retool and kind of rework that one." Yeah, that's that's a great question. And and so I had Bean on the Sarah Buffalo podcast. One of the questions I asked him was, "Is their salary cap real?" Because you see teams like the Rams that can go all in, and you're thinking. How can you possibly fit all of those guys under the salary cap? And then you have other teams that can hardly fill out a roster. Um, and, and they have maybe two guys that it seems like only two guys are getting paid on the team. And he had a great explanation that, you know, when you put stuff on credit, eventually you're going to have to pay for it. You might not pay for it right now. Now, if you have an owner that's willing to constantly fork the bill on that, you can essentially string it as long as you want. They could string it out for, you know, Every every couple of years, keep stringing it out, and fifteen years from now, hopefully, when hopefully Josh plays, you know that long, then you know you're going to go through a transition, and it's likely not going to be a smooth one. And you pay the piper then, and then you bounce back. But when I look at what they could do and what they need to do, like like if this team just gets healthy and is healthy at the end of the year, they have the best roster in football, in my opinion. And so there's not drastic changes that need to be made when you look at the offensive side of the ball. The only spot I'm really looking at is wide receiver, and that kind of is what's going to go on with Diggs. Is he going to bounce back and produce like he did at the beginning of the year? Can we really trust what we saw from Shakir? Or are teams going to kind of figure him out a little bit like they did Gabe Davis and get up and press Gabe and not give him over the top, and then all of a sudden he's you know going three out of four games without a catch at times? And so – can they bring in someone that can truly separate? They tried to go bargain last year with uh, Deontay Hardy, and, you know, he's a gadget guy, and, you know, he has the monster punt return against the Dolphins, and he made some impact plays this year, but you need someone that can come in and, and separate and produce, and so if you don't have the money to pay those guys, you're likely going to have to draft a guy in the first round. I mean, it is what it is This is from all indications, and, I'll admit I've watched the least amount of college football these last couple of years I have my whole life. But from all I read, this is a deep wide receiver draft. There's a bunch of studs out there. So that would be on the offensive side of the ball. And then the defensive side of the ball, question marks at safety, maybe defensive tackle with the amount of free agents. But finding maybe one more pass rusher, whether that's a Leonard Floyd type, pick him up in the summer you know, or that's a draft pick, or that's a development, you know, kind of a next step from a Greg Rousseau, you know, next step from Ed Oliver in the playoffs. Uh, something like that would stand out to me because ultimately when it comes down to it, you can have studs all over the defensive side of the ball, but if you cannot put pressure on a quarterback in the AFC in the playoffs, you're going to get bounced. And when the Bills have been bounced the last three years, the amount of points they've given up to, and look, this is Burrow and Mahomes twice, but the amount of yards and points they've given up has been astronomical. And a lot of that's because you just can't blitz these guys. And if you can't get pressure with a four man rush, you're going to get torched in the playoffs. So I said a lot, what's, what's your thoughts as the bills look at personnel wise uh, heading into the off season? Yeah. You know, you mentioned Hardy um, kind of uh, swing and a miss might be a little hard. Um, because I don't, maybe the expectations coming here were a little too lofty for in what a, he, in a salary what it, exactly. 
So that's what I mean. So I don't, you know, and, and I'm with you. I think you got to draft. You know, I think that's the wide receiver spot, something you draft. But for the, you know, maybe Hardy not meeting the expectations that Bills fans wanted to see, Leonard Floyd was the opposite of that. Right. He sacks. I mean, he led the team in sacks. I mean, I think he signed in June. I think Brandon Bean got him in June. I mean, you want to talk about an absolute monster signing that late in the process. I mean, there there had to be, you know, 30 other teams looking around going, what? Well, how did we miss this? How did we miss on that guy? You think that's the Von Miller effect? I do. I think some of it's that. And I think, I think you know, I know that they're – there's split thoughts on the culture. You know, is it as important as some people say it is? I think for those players that believe it's important, it's very important. And I think that a Leonard Floyd maybe gets inside that building and hears Vaughn Miller preaching a certain message and then hears it from Sean and then hears it from Eric Washington and then hears it from Bobby Babich and, and, and so on and so forth. And then it just kind of percolates and you just constantly hear it and it gets you in a spot where you go, this is a safe place where I can grow my game a little bit. And not and- to get off talk and not to get off topic on that, culture is important in a place like Buffalo. And and look, the culture doesn't have to be the Patriot way. The culture can be, hey, we got a bunch of dudes, we work hard, we have fun. Josh has people over his house. That used to be Vaughn at their time in Denver. Now it's Josh has people over after games and the guys get together. Well, when you're paying New York State taxes and you're not in a destination city, having a great culture and having great management, having a brand and being in the building, which everybody love, everyone loves them. Okay, that makes that makes a difference. Go ahead. Yeah, no, I, I mean, you can speak on that. And I'm not going to ask you to throw management under the bus and stuff like that. But, I mean, it also helps when you're winning because right. it's easy to sell culture when, when you win. And I think that was so important for Sean. I mean, correct me if I'm wrong, for him to end that drought like that, I, it's easy then to sell your message. Am I wrong? Yeah, 100%. Because if not, the trust, the process, the – the grind, the rigidity that Sean can bring to the table each day. And and look, Sean will have music on and meeting rooms before we get in there. There's a basketball hoop in the, you know, in the indoor complex. He might have video games where an offensive and defensive guys, uh, you know, do a two minute drill to see who's got to run after practice and meet meeting. So there is some like fun competition, but like when you show up at the Bills facility, you know you're going to get ready to work. And and Sean will have a little bit of fun like that at times, but he's going to grind you, and he's going to grind you to, through the entire season. So, yes, if you're not winning, eventually you're going to say, okay, the shtick's over. And so them, them that staff and, and, you know, that regime winning early definitely helps. And then you, you hit the nail on the head. It could be as fun as you want, but the only thing fun in pro sports is winning because if you're not winning, you're going to lose your job and your buddies are losing their jobs. And there's nothing fun about, you know, the couple that you're best friends with getting fired in week 15. Like there's nothing fun about that. There's nothing fun about turning over the roster every year. And so even when you can have a fun culture, which was at times during my career, maybe for a couple of years, we had a lot of fun. We just didn't. Honestly, we didn't have the quarterback play, which you need in the NFL, obviously. And so, yes, the the winning culture is the most important culture. But how do you get to that winning culture? It can be done a number of different ways, but I say a lot of times it's just consistency. It's a consistent approach by the head coach message because otherwise everyone's going to read through it and say this dude's a phony. Yeah, and and let's stick there with Sean because I know that obviously he caught a lot of heat throughout the season. You know, there's there's still – pretty decent size amount of Bills fans that think that he's not going to be able to get them over the hump to where they can win a Super Bowl. I'm not in that in that group. I, I believe I'm not there yet, at least. I, I mean, I'm not saying that that's not something that you sign up for, for, hey, 15 years from now, they're still losing in the second round, that, that you're cool with that. Um, but, yeah, I, you know, I keep – most recently I thought about Peyton Manning, all right, and I thought about Tom Brady and – you know, you start to see Patrick Mahomes rack up all of these Super Bowl appearances. And at some point, do you, do you wrap your head around the fact that maybe what we're looking at is pay, Patrick Mahomes is Tom Brady 2.0 and maybe Josh Allen is Peyton Manning 2.0. And guess what? 
If he plays 17 years and you get two rings, now I know that Manning did one with two different franchises, but I mean, I, I think you sign up for that because nobody looks at Peyton Manning and thinks of him as less than, right? So if Josh Allen has to be, play second fiddle, if you will, to Patrick Mahomes, I think that's something you'd sign up for. And Manning didn't win his first Super Bowl until year eight. Right. Yeah, he was 30 years old, uh, came into the league and led the league in interceptions, maybe set an NFL record for most interceptions by a rookie quarterback. Part of that is I understand he was a number one overall pick, so they were just going to ride with him through the interceptions as opposed to yanking a rookie and not letting him cut his teeth because he wasn't the number one overall pick. I say all that, you know, I would sign up for that that run um, if you could guarantee that in. But, I mean, what the Chiefs have done, I mean, it's – it's remarkable. There's there's a lot of teams around the AFC that are are unsatisfied with their results because of what the Chiefs have done. Not necessarily anything that they've done, but because of what the Chiefs are able to do year in and year out. Sometimes it's offensive firepower, and a lot of that's Mahomes. And then this year it's the defense, and they've invested so much draft capital into that defense. But when I look at Sean, uh, there's nothing in me that says we need to get rid of Sean McDermott. He's been the model of consistency and – Look, I grew up a Bengals fan, and we were the worst team in the league at that time, the longest playoff drought in all of pro sports. And then I go to the Bills, and then we take over that title. But then uh, Marvin Lewis takes over, and I understand they couldn't win a playoff game, but they go to the playoffs, what, seven years in a row or seven of eight years? Yeah. And all my buddies are like, man, the Bills got to get rid – or the Bengals got to get rid of Marvin Lewis. I'm thinking, man, do you, re do you remember how bad the team was before Marvin got there? You know, it, it can take time. and they're consistently winning. Enjoy the ride. And now I say that when you have Josh Allen, your expectations is to get to and win a Super Bowl at some point. Now I'll say this, Sean McDermott, you know, he comes in and he's got a staff of guys that he had to find from around the league. Essentially you get hired from a staff with Ron Rivera in Carolina. Well, you can't just poach all those coaches, those great coaches that you had under you uh, that Ron Rivera had. And so he pieced it together and I'll give Sean credit. Over time, he's molded his staff to how he's wanted. And then he, you know, eventually hits a home run with Brian Dayball as offensive coordinator. But whenever you do that, those guys are going to leave. And so then it's, okay, do we find a proven offensive mind or do we give a guy like Dorsey a chance? Okay, it didn't work out after a year and a half. Cool, I'm going with Joe Brady and I'm going to make that switch. And then the Bills get hot. He's willing to make those changes. And I'll say this, I don't know if Bobby Babbage is going to call plays or not, but everybody wants that young, hot offensive coordinator, defense coordinator to be their head coach. Okay, we still have a fairly young head coach in Sean McDermott, who's the model of consistency. Okay, well, now we got Joe Brady and Bobby Babich leading the offense and the defense. They have that young energy, that uh, that Sean McVay style of leadership where I bring the high energy, I can relate. I'm not this old school, rigid, cuss you out, tell you how much you suck. I'm this encouraging, build you up get you to play your best because now you're empowered type. And that's what everyone wants to lead their organization. Okay, well, now we have it on both sides of the football, and we have a proven head coach uh, that's a proving winning head coach. Like, I'll sign up for this, you know, kind of trio at the top right now, the coaching staff, uh, any day of the week. What's your, what's your thoughts on the new coordinator hires? Yeah, you know, I, you mentioned Ron Rivera there. So I'm going to tie all this together. Uh, I went over to his podium the right after the Bills had hired Sean McDermott to be their head coach. And he had a podium at the NFL scouting combine in Indianapolis. So I go over there because I want to find out about the Bills' new head coach. I mean, what better guy to ask than Ron Rivera? So I said, hey, Ron, what advice did you give Sean? He said, I told him as a first-time head coach in the NFL, surround yourself with experienced coordinators. What's Sean do? Rick Dennison? Leslie Frazier, right? Right. That, and it's crazy how – it's evolved now. Now that Sean has all this experience under his belt, now he's been able. Now he's able to go younger in both of those important spots. I mean, I looked this up last night because <laughs> I don't know this off the top of my head, but I mean, Leslie Frazier and Rick Dennison were born in the fifties. Wow. Babbage and Joe Brady were born in the eighties. Right. So I mean that that tells you where that you know where that shift the the, the paradigm kind of shift there happen with Sean as he kind of looks at the coordinators. I think, they get, like you mentioned, I think they bring an energy to that staff that's needed. I think 
I think both of those guys are going to be excellent at their job. I think we got a taste of it already at Joe Brady. Bobby Babich is the guy that fans don't quite know yet that they should because every position group that he's worked with, you've seen success from his position group. And I mean, what he was able to do in kind of helping Tremaine Edmonds get a little bit closer to the player that he could become before he left via free agency. You know, Matt Milano was already a polished product, so I'm not going to give him credit on that one. I mean, I can coach Matt Milano. I can be like, hey, Matt, just go out and do Matt Milano things. You, t- so- you say that, you say that, but my buddy who coached him at Boston College was not as optimistic that he could, wow. you know, he coached him. He loves him to death, and he was like, he'll have a long career. Um, he'll start off as a special teamers, could develop into a, a starting linebacker like He's one of the best three off-ball linebackers in football. It's incredible. I don't know, though, that I'd give – I'd probably give the the assistants that came before Babby Bobich at that linebacker spot. Who was his dad? Who was Bob yeah, Babich's dad? dad? Exactly. So, But what he was able to do for Terrell Bernard, I mean – Unbelievable. That, that's that's it's sensational. And look, you know, not to get too far off track, but, you know, you, you get a healthy Matt Milano with what Terrell Bernard turned into. That linebacking crew suddenly, boom, is – one of the top pairing, you know, especially athletically in, in the NFL. That, that's going to be fun to watch. But, yeah, I, I like what they did in both coordinator spots. I, I, I really do. I think it's I think it's going to be fun to see how those two kind of develop and everything. And, of course, at the end of the day, what's going to happen? If they're successful, they're going to end up finding a head coaching job somewhere. And, that, and that's kind of what you want because if you're not successful, they don't have a job for a completely different reason. And this is one, I got a bunch of buddies. I live, I live in Louisville. I'm from Cincinnati. A lot of my buddies are Bengals fans. Lou Anarumo is struggling to get a head coaching job. And I don't know what it is. He's almost got the Eric B enemy effect where every year his units perform and they don't get the head coaching job. So you're like, can we just get a video of one of their interviews? Like, are they just awful in these head coaching interviews? But and, and I, I don't know this that this ever happens. And there's there's enough ego and enough pride in this business where you want to get to the top. But, OK, let's say Joe Brady absolutely crushes it again this year uh, and he gets eight head coaching interviews next year. If I'm a Terry Pagula, I might say, hey, Joe, that organization's in a bad place. You know, if your family really likes it here, how about I give you five and a half million dollars a year to stay? I mean, what's that worth? You know, to me, like you let these coordinators walk and what what if you just made them extremely high paid, like yeah. like beyond what a coordinator's ever been paid before to keep them around? I don't know if the this is this is coming from a former center saying this. I don't know if the defensive side of the football justifies it, especially with Sean at the top, but on the offensive side of the ball. So you have a defensive head coach similar to Cincinnati with Zach Taylor on one side. Well, Lou Anarumo is running everything on the defense side of the ball. Zach Taylor is not even walking in those meeting rooms all year. And so to me, I wouldn't shy away from paying Lou Anarumo $6 million to stay and say, hey, look, Lou, you've been here for a while. I'm sure your family likes it at this point. It's a great town. You know, yes, you're going to give up the head coaching title for a few years, but I'll give you a $30 million contract to stay and make you the head coach in waiting in case something happens with Zach. You know, if I know the head coaching business, you know, you want to get in the coaching business, you want to get that head job. But to me, I could see that as an evolution of the coaching industry. Uh, uh, Okay, then let me play devil's advocate. Right. For a player, right? Uh, all of a sudden you see not only the head coach making more money than you, now you're seeing assistant coaches making more money than you. If I'm a player, I'm going, wait a second here. And and there's got to be a cutoff somewhere. Now, look, I'm not saying player 53 should be worried about that. Player 53 needs to worry about being on the roster. But player 11, you know, on on the starting offense might go, hey, wait a second. Why is the offensive coordinator coordinator make it three times more than I am? Because unless you're a quarterback, he's got more impact than you. Yeah, that's, yeah. Or or a star receiver. I mean, look. I mean, you can get the starting center out for a game, and the line doesn't move. And not to say that he's not a valuable piece, but a, a guard, whoever it is, like Joe Thune being out for the Chiefs, doesn't move the line one inch. It it doesn't move at a half a point, and so. To me, the offensive coordinator can play a much bigger role if he's that type of dude. If he's if he's that guy that can 
you know, year in and year out, produce a solid offense. He can also give you some wiggle room to pay other guys on the other side of the ball because, you know, he's going to be able to get that side of the ball to play well. I will say this about salaries and coaches. It's often awkward at times when the players are making so much more than the head coach. And and not that and I'm not referring to a quarterback head coach um deal because you know the quarterback's paid because he's the CEO of the or you know, he's the most important player person in the organization. The head coach could miss the game because he's sick and you know, the line's not gonna move nearly as much as if the starting quarterback's out. But when I remember a time when we made a guy the highest paid defensive player in football and his effort wasn't quite there for a few games, and it became really awkward when there was nothing you could do about it in meetings. Like the, there was just, you could say all you want and he's got all of his money and the head coach has paid a third of the amount as that guy. And it just, it just becomes awkward uh, in that instance. And so, um, yeah, there's no perfect solution to this. You know, those circling back to the coordinators, like eventually they're likely going to want a head coaching job and have it run, you know, an organization how they want. And that's, that's likely why they're all in this industry. But, you know, in the meantime, pay those guys, especially when they're on the opposite side of the ball from the head coach. Yeah, that's uh, you mentioned Tooney there. Got a big one coming up Sunday. Obviously, the Super Bowl should be a good one. I mean, I I think both teams are absolutely stacked with talent. Vegas, man, that would have been pretty sweet to be there right about now. Are you going to go out and, and what's have you have you done Super Bowls before when you were playing and have you done it many since? Yeah, so when I was playing, I would generally go to every city the Super Bowl was, and there's gifting suites. You know, I was a Nike client, so I'd go to the Nike suite. I was with Athletes First, the biggest football agency, and I'd go to their gifting suites, and there'd be all types of brands there. I would intentionally pack a very small suitcase so that I could get all the stuff home uh, that I was going to get Super Bowl weekend because you just show up everywhere all day. You know, you get a cocktail here, you meet this you know, celebrity at this deal. And look, for a kid from the West side of Cincinnati, I was like, this is truly unbelievable. The people we'd see, the experiences we have every night is a series of mega parties with, you know, last year at the Super Bowl, I saw Drake at a 200 person concert. I saw Machine Gun Kelly. We saw Usher perform. I mean, the, the concerts that are at these parties are just out of this world. And so, You know, when I was playing, it was more kind of hang with the guys. I might do a play 60 event or I might do one year. I did Garth Brooks charity event. It was a football camp up in Indianapolis. Like I'll do more of that kind of stuff back then. Now that I don't make, you know, one fiftieth of the money. uh, Now I'll do, you know, some appearances for the bills and, you know, pop around for some dinners. Last year I met uh, this group of Australians that came in for the game and just talked to them about football and the rules and, you know, they were looking for betting advice and whatnot. And I'm like, man, you guys are a trip. Like, and it was, it was so refreshing. It's like, uh, sometimes when I'm watching a football game with my wife, she'll ask me a, a really good question that I've taken for granted for just so long. And that's how these Australians were. So this year I'm not going out to Vegas. Um, I have a speaking gig in Vegas in a week and a half. I'm not dying to go back there twice in two weeks. And then uh, a casino up in Buffalo paid me to come up and do an appearance this weekend. So I'll be up in Buffalo. I also am knocking out one of the dinners uh, for the Evan Wood Fund auction. So I will not be out in Vegas, but there will be some serious FOMO. I got invited to play in the Pickleball, which is like the big Pickleball social media accounts, the PPA. They're putting on an event out in Vegas, and Golden Tate knows uh, that I play in pickleball tournaments and whatnot. So he was like, dude, let's team up and take it on. And we both got invited. I was like, oh, that's, that one's going to hurt. There's a few golf events and whatnot. The live tours out there, and I've become buddies with some of those guys. Um, but I just spent – we talked about the whole one. I just spent five nights and six days <laughs> in Florida. It's like if I can be gone for one night and get the essentially the same payment uh, as, as being gone three nights, uh, I think it's best to be – best to be back home with the family, but I generally take off before the game starts. So I watched the Super Bowl with my family and friends back in Louisville, which is always a rough 6 a.m. flight heading home from wherever city we're at, but uh, it's always fun. And, you know, last year I stayed at Richie Incognito's house and we spent three days together and bounced around together and you connect with old teammates. And and for someone that uh, whose career ended early and I wasn't ready to be done playing football, just being around football guys, 
for a few days. It's good for the soul, but I, I don't need the hole in one was good enough for the soul for this month. So that'll get me through. Do you ever, do you ever head out for the game? Yeah. You know what? Um, I did once I covered the Ravens Niners Super Bowl down in new Orleans, which was, I mean, outside of Vegas, I can't imagine a spot where it would be crazier. I mean, they literally paused Mardi Gras. Right. The hostess. I mean, they paused the biggest party maybe, you know, of the year in this country. Paused Mardi Gras to have the Super Bowl. It was it was sensational. Um, like you said, the concerts are just everywhere. Um, Little Wayne played the GQ party, and it was just like like you said, it was like 200, 300 people. It was crazy. You would be at the GQ. You would be at the GQ party. <laughs> I was looking for fashion advice. The uh, and then uh, I got the, my favorite one was I got a chance to go to Mike Ditka hosted a cigar party with Ron Jaworski. Um, yeah, it was unbelievable. I mean, just getting a chance to talk to him. Uh, you know, my dad isn't a huge sports fan. He just, you know, he'll watch it if it's on that kind of thing. But for whatever reason, I think I know why. I think guys of his age, like Ditka spoke to him. Like, it was like, ah, Ditka, like, that's a guy I like. Like, that's, and I think that, so when I told him I had a chance to meet Mike Ditka, it was really cool. And Ditka's a Pittsburgh guy, and I grew up in Northeast Ohio, so it's not too far from each other. Uh, Similar type of towns, Youngstown, Ohio, Pittsburgh. So I got a chance to talk to him a little bit. We ended up talking family. He asked me what my dad did because I told him he was a huge fan. I said, well, he owns his own business, excavating business, but he used to work in a steel mill. Dick, it was like my dad worked in a steel mill. Like, and it, it suddenly there was that little, all it takes is that little bit of a connection there. And yeah. it was, it was, it was so cool listening to him tell stories. Like I look over at the door, Bart Starr comes walking in with a hall of fame jacket on. I'm like, where am I? Like, it, it's almost like I died and went into like football heaven. And I'm right. like, look at all these, like, what am I standing in the middle of right now? So that was, that was a really cool experience. One of my favorite experiences of uh, a little over two decades in this industry. Is there, who do you like? I mean, I obviously I'm assuming that it's hard for you to pull for the chiefs, but who do you, who do you like? You like the Niners? You like the chiefs in this one? Is there, is there a reason, maybe a personal relationship why you would pull for one team over the other? Uh, no, I'm pulling for the 49ers. And the main reason is because I'm so petty. And like we talked about Mahomes kind of separating himself from Josh, I'm good enough buddies with Josh. And I, I'm such a fan of his that I don't want him to be so much further separated from Mahomes. And if he adds another ring, he truly would be other than that. It doesn't matter that much to me if they win another Super Bowl. Does it allow them to attract more free agents? Maybe it could also make their players and their free agents more desirable to other teams where they get cherry picked for free agents. So you can kind of look at that from both ways. I've never met Kyle Shanahan. He's really good buddies with Bobby Babbage from when their time in Cleveland. Like they're they're really close. Bobby's a huge fan of his. I've heard legendary stories about his dad and the parties that they would have post training camp that we'll save for a, another podcast. But I'm a I'm a Kyle Shanahan fan. I loved watching his offenses, and so I'm I'm pulling for the Niners. And mainly, I want to see Kyle win one, and then Brock Purdy to me just get it. So my first game I ever called was for Fox, and it was Iowa State Kansas State. Brock Purdy's freshman year. And their coaches raved about him. Campbell, their head coach at Iowa State, was like, this kid is unbelievable. If he doesn't tear his ACL in high school, he's at Alabama. Instead, he's here with us. Well, then he plays well at Iowa State throughout four years. And he becomes the last pick in the draft because he's, you know, 6'2". And he's got some mobility, but not a ton and not a cannon. And, you know, he's a good-looking kid, but he doesn't, like, necessarily look like Jimmy Garoppolo. And so you put all that together, it becomes the last pick in the draft. And to me... I don't know. He's just easy to root for. His comment the other day about if he could build a fantasy team, who would he put on it? And he said, our skill guys and Josh Allen. I'm like, okay, that's about all I needed to know. So I'm pulling for them right now. They're a two point favorite and and I could see him covering it. I truly can. This chief's defense is susceptible against the run. We saw it against the bills at times. The bills ran downhill on him and really controlled that football game until those last three possessions. And so I think they'll be able to run the football, which will then open up the passing lanes. And they got weapons that can separate on the outside when they do run their 
goofy pressures with man defense behind it. Uh, I, I like the Niners in this one. Who you like? Yeah, I, I love the Brock Purdy story, Mr. Irrelevant. Um, shout out to Matt Campbell. I've known go back to Mount Union College in his playing days. Um, but yeah, the Brock Purdy story is great, Mr. Irrelevant. Um, I, I, the, I enjoyed the first time the story happened when it was called Tom Brady. Um, I mean, you know, if he wins a Super Bowl now, it kind of is. And then if he can win another one, then all of a sudden the Tom Brady story becomes, well, I mean, he wasn't Mr. Irrelevant. I mean, right. kind of kind of a weird thing that we could be watching happen again. I mean, and then you start wondering if NFL teams start to go, hey, you know, maybe we should throw a dart at a quarterback late in the draft. If if there's a Purdy sitting around, I know it doesn't happen often, but hey, all it takes is once. Look at RG3 and Kirk Cousins. Yeah, Ex- exactly. Same draft. I, I, I like the I, I like the Niners. Um, probably for more personal reasons. I got to know Anthony Lynn and his family when they were here in Buffalo. I think Anthony's a stand up guy. He's a running backs coach now for the Niners. The assistant head coach. Um, they're just a great family. Um, he's got a couple. I think two, maybe definitely one ring as a player. Um, so it'd be, it'd be kind of cool to see him get one as a coach. And, you know, a lot of people forget that, you know, he had that one interim game. I think it was just one, right? You, you probably remember that he, he took over for Rex when Rex was right. No, they do, I think it was two or three. Okay. Two or three. So, and then he goes on and gets that chargers gig and, you know, his head coaching record is actually over 500. So it's kind of weird that he hasn't gotten a sniff at all in, in another chance. Now I know that, you know, the trend is we've talked about this already of, of the younger, more Sean McVay type guys. And maybe Anthony doesn't fit in that mold, but I'd like to, you know, for Anthony and his family, I'd like to see the Niners get it. I like you said, Brock Purdy's a great story. And I personally love watching Christian McCaffrey play. I think what he mm-hmm. does on the football field is uh, there aren't many, and I'm going to ask you this too. There aren't many guys that we're very fortunate in our jobs that we get a chance to get paid and go watch these guys play, right? There aren't many guys in any sport that I would pay my money to buy a ticket to go, I'm going to go watch that guy play. He is one of the few guys that I'd go, I'm going to give my money to go watch him play. Is there there a guy that stands out, you know, outside of the Bills building? Because I think we both would agree Josh Allen would be at the top of that list. Is there a guy, though, in the NFL where you'd go, I'd give my money, pay a ticket to go watch that guy play. You know, I definitely, in the era that I grew up, like when I was first coming into the league, my first Super Bowl that I went to was, it was down in Miami, but it was Indianapolis and New Orleans. Like Peyton Manning was one of those guys. Tom Brady was one of those guys. And then it, it becomes really awkward when you see them in the captain's circle and you're like, do I do I dap them up? Do I shake their hand? Do I bow? Like, how, how do we do this? Uh, for, <laughs> For me, for me, it's more um, like hockey, basketball, golf, getting great access and just watching them up close because, look, and I, and I never even touched the football beyond the snap in the NFL, so I'm not saying I can do what all these guys do, but I'm just so used to seeing it. Man, I mean, going to the PJ Championship and standing inside the ropes and watching those guys warm up and just watching them hit and how their routine is and all that, like, to me – that's what I would pay my money to go see, not necessarily a football game, just because, you know, you're just kind of used to seeing it in person. And then you just assume we'll we'll get to, we're going to Santa Clara next year. So we'll go see Christian McCaffrey in person next year. One more quick thing on Kyle Shanahan. I heard this yesterday when he was with the Falcons and they lost in the in epic fashion. You know, Matt Ryan was the MVP that year, which I kind of took for granted. And you kind of forget like how good of an offensive coordinator Kyle Shanahan truly is. That was the eighth highest scoring offense in NFL history with Matt Ryan at quarterback. And I'm really struggling to name. They had Julio Jones on the outside, but it's like, and then they had Devontae Freeman. He did nothing after that. They had um, one other smaller running back as well. who it was, did nothing. Was, ever. Was, was that Foreman? Was Foreman on that team? Maybe, but it's like, Guys, Kyle Shanahan in in what he's able to do on the offensive side of the football in kind of an old school under center way 
It's just remarkable. And I've played with guys that play for him and it's all details. It's details. And then just attacking like, Oh, you're going to make this adjustment. Oh, you're completely screwed now. Like, and it's, you know, they might not score on the first drive and you give, you give uh, Shanahan those pictures after that first series, he's going to have you dialed and those chunks are going to start coming. So we, there's a, there's so much more. We're 45 minutes in. There's so much more we can get to. We'll save it to another one. We got Kentucky Derby stories. We got, restaurant takes and wing takes and all that we'll, we'll be chronicling your trip around the country as well likely but we're going to get josh as a mainstay on this podcast uh he's got two more to go to match fits but i have a feeling that uh josh is gonna uh surpass fitzpatrick's uh number of podcasts on this one so i appreciate your time buddy as always and i always look forward to catching up with you yeah e, let's do it again man i appreciate you as always appreciate your friendship and everything Yep. Likewise, brother.